Boy, if you think back to where we've been uh, since uh, the past uh, month and a half, I guess, maybe, when this uh, study of Gospel of Mark, and we're only in chapter 6, um, but um, we'll get through it today. Uh, I think it's been um, a lot, chapter 6 has a lot packed into it, and that's what's uh, keeping us uh, there for a little bit. Remember now, Jesus has been ministering in throughout Galilee for about two years. This is the beginning of his third year, and from here he's going down into Jerusalem, uh, and that's where he, and the rest of Mark, uh, has where he meets, um, he goes into the temple, um, and these also familiar stories about his being put on trial and then executed, um, and then uh, risen uh, from the dead. But now we're in year um, three of a three-year ministry uh, in Galilee. Galilee is a region that measures about 25 by 50 miles, 25 by 50 miles. That would be about two and a half times the size of Harford County. Two and a half times the size of Harford County. Um, and a part of that is the lake, too, the, uh, the lake or the Sea of Galilee, um, which is 7 by 13, uh, generally, a mile, 7 by 13. Um, now, we've just finished the miraculous feeding of the thousands. Remember, um, he was creating food from grain that had never been cultivated, had never been processed. He was serving f dead fish that had never been alive and never swum. Um, and uh, it was a massive miracle uh, that Jesus performed, not just uh, in, in a small group, but what is massive is that there were thousands, remember they say 5,000, we multiply that by three or four, um, and we get 15 or 20,000 people, uh, including wives and children. So, um, they, and everybody benefits. It turns out to be a delicious food, and they were satisfied, or, and the Greek is stuffed. It's like Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Uh, when you can't, it's hard to move or you get sleepy afterwards, you know. Uh, so um, it, that's, that's what's just happened. Um, and uh, so um, thousands of people are affected. Now, when thousands of people, they're going to go home and they're going to get the way. You can't believe what happened to us. We were listening to Jesus. We all got, and then he, he fed us all. And not only that, um, and remember Hendrickson says, uh, it's just amazing the precision that the Lord had because there were 12 baskets, traveling baskets of food uh, left over, uh, and that's enough for the 12 uh, disciples. So it was a mir miraculous feeding, and it increased Jesus' popularity uh, in Galilee. Now, part of what they got excited about is that they looked at Jesus as maybe their leader, their king, to lead a revolt against the Roman rule, which was so predominant uh, in, that, in that time. They saw Jesus as possibly a powerful king who could lead the revolt. Now, Jesus' disciples were thinking the same thing. They, too, were eager for a revolution against Rome. But Jesus wanted to dispel that vision. Don't pay any attention to that. He wanted to avoid an understanding like that and to avoid the kind of pressure that that would lead to uh, from the crowd. And we'll read about that this morning. Jesus had not come to lead a revolt. Jesus had come the first time to die to pay the penalty for his people's sin, to rise again in victory, and to, to establish the church and the beginning of the church age. And we'll see that. And that's what's happening right now. The church is small. It's only, how, how big is the church now? It's Jesus plus 12, right? That's about it. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's, um, it's just beginning, and it's an exciting time but Jesus sees that, no, we, I've got a schedule to meet. The revolt has nothing to do with it. I'm going to dispel these rumors, or I'm going to quash this excitement that's building. 
um, and move on to my uh, ministry. When he comes the second time, that's when every knee shall bow. Jesus, for now, is the spiritual king of those who bow to his authority and who trust in him. The crowds, for now, are self-focused and self-righteous. And only a few are beginning to sense that Jesus is divine. And remember, this, one of the central themes of Mark is who is Jesus. And we'll see, even though as, as some dramatic things happen in, chapter, in this part of chapter 6, the disciples' hearts are what? Hard. The disciples, those who are closest to him. Let's read Chapter 6, verse 45 to 52. Starting at verse 45, chapter 6. Immediately, there's that word. He made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea. And he, that is Jesus, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that Jesus, he saw that they, that's the disciples, he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass them by. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out. And this is, that cried out is shrieking, really. That's the, that's the sense of the Greek verb. All right. For they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. Verse 52, For they did not understand about the loaves, it just happened. But their hearts were hardened. Now, at the same time, I want to refer to John 6. Um, I had, this, this is one incident that is, uh, I got some cross-references here. Then I did it so often, I had to mark the pages in my, in my Bible. So let's go to John 6 for a minute. John 6. I'll start in verse 15, I'll read through 21. Perceiving then, that they, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force. Now, this is Jesus, looks at that crowd, the crowd's getting animated, they're getting excited. This guy's going to do it, he's going to lead the revolt, we're going to make him king. And, and Jesus, that's what was concerning to him. Um, verse 15, perceiving then that they, that is the crowd, were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Continuing in John 6, verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum, which was kind of his headquarters, his ministry headquarters at Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then 
they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. So in John's account, it's not clear that they had to row, they were rowing, the boat maybe just picked up and was put by the shore. Do you see that? Now, Jesus can do that. You know he can. He can go from here to there. He can walk through walls. We know that when he's resurrected. Uh, so this is a significant uh, difference, kind of a thrilling difference, uh, isn't it, uh, in John's account. So, Jesus sends the disciples ahead of him in the boat. He prays. He sees the disciples way off course and in distress. He walks on water to get to them. He gets into the boat. The sea gets calm, and they, con they continue to Genesaret. And Genesaret is a beautiful, uh, and, and it's fertile, it's uh, shore, it's, it's uh, a, a plain, a beautiful plain south of Caber uh, Capernaum. It's on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. That's where they're headed. It's just south of Capernaum. Remember Capernaum, that's his Galilee headquarters for ministry. Capernaum is a wealthy, uh, kind of up, um, wealthy, well-to-do fishing village because there's a lot of commerce going on. There's so many fish in the Sea of Galilee that they're exporting fish, so they're making money. They're, they're doing this. That's Capernaum. Immediately, why the rush? The crowd was getting stirred up to make Jesus their king and to lead a revolt. Jesus needs to keep the twelve safe from the crowd. This is, ex and uh, perceiving then that, uh, John, I just read this, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is exactly, that revolt is exactly what the disciples and many others were hoping for. Now, before him, going back to Mark, you can kind of, if you're going to open your Bible, you might want to keep it open at, at Mark and your finger in John. Um, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him. Go before him uh, indicates that he's going to send them off and he's going to meet them. And that's, that's the, so the idea is that they go ahead and they meet later uh, at Genesaret. To Bethsaida indicates they were traveling from east of Bethsaida. Remember, that's the little fishing village on the northeast corner uh, or shore of um, of uh, the Sea of Galilee. Now, to travel there, he's going to travel from there, he's going to travel west, uh, heading for Capernaum. Now, the miracle of the feeding occurred east of Bethsaida. So, they're going to have to travel west past Bethsaida, and remember, it was getting dark. The disciples probably planned to navigate their way across the lake by following the shoreline. He made, verse 45, he made the disciples get into the boat. The connotation there is that he ordered them to get into the boat. Remember, they're under his authority. He says, get into the boat. Uh, the boat indicates that there was a boat designated. They knew which one to get into. Um, and uh, that, uh, so they knew what he meant. He was very clear. He made them get into the boat. It was an order that, uh, for them to obey. The boat probably puts out alone. The crowd sees that Jesus is not in the boat with the disciples. Now, in John's Gospel, the people in Capernaum the next day will wonder how Jesus got there. Wait a minute. Well, you didn't get in the boat. How did you get here? Since he had given the boat to the, to the disciples to use. Remember, so he shipped them out. Then he dispelled the crowd. And then he went up to the, in, in, uh, on a hill or something. 
uh, to be to be uh, to pray. Jesus needed some quiet time with his father up on the mountain. He was alone. There's an example and a lesson for us too. How often we have needed ourselves uh, with our with our Lord. Now. They're on the water. The apostles struggle against the wind. Probably they were blown off course and away from the shore they were trying to stay close to. They resorted to rowing. Hmm. What would be their preference? Their preference would be to sail. Rowing was not their first choice. Moreover, rowing, and I've done some, you row backwards. You don't see where you're going when you're rowing. Uh, and this will, have, this will have an effect, too, when Jesus begins to uh, make uh, an appearance on the water. Fourth watch of the night. I'm in, let's see... Verse 48, and about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. The fourth watch, what does that mean? That means about three o'clock in the morning. As dark during the night as it's ever going to be. How dark it is right before dawn. Now, the Roman, they were using the Roman counting of hours, counting of time. The Romans, we had 24 hours in a day. They had 12 hours for night. They took that 12 hours and they broke it up in months of three hours each. So the first watch went from six to nine. John 6 says, when evening came. The first watch from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. The second watch from 9 p.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, 12 a.m. <laughs> 12 a.m. The third watch from 12 a.m. The fourth watch and this is when it is from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Now, if those disciples started at dusk during the first watch, during the fourth watches when Jesus went, to, they had been at night, they had been in that boat struggling for eight or nine hours. I can tell you that seven or eight minutes of rowing in a race you're just, about, you're just about done at the end of that. And here they were. Now, I don't know how many oars they had in the boat. I don't know how, uh, and we do know that there were 12 guys in there, at least 12 guys, 12 guys in there. And they must have ro rotated um, among, uh, taking turns rowing. Now, John 6 again. I want to go back to verse 25. John 6, um, now the crowd sees him, he's over on, on the other side now, he's in uh, Capernaum, he's made it to the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, he's south of Capernaum, this crowd sees him, and he says, when they found him, that is the crowd, on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Maybe, say a couple of commentators, maybe they were hungry for breakfast and they knew they could get it from Jesus because he had created food for them the night before. Other boats... Uh, let's see, uh, uh, 25. Uh, truly, truly, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. 27. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, 
which the Son of Man will give to you. This is the beginning of a remarkable sermon by Jesus in Capernaum in the synagogue. And this is a, a sermon so stark and strong that people are offended by it. And people in the crowd, including uh, disciples in the crowd, say, I've had enough of this. I can't bear it. I'm not sticking with this guy. I'm out of here. Like the rest of the crowd, the disciples in the crowd were focused on Jesus as the leader of a violent revolt against Roman occupation. No rebellion? We're out of here. They were focused on earthly things. John 6 again, verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. That's because he'd been talking about, if you want to stay with me, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. I'm the Son of God. As soon as they start heard that, that's what they've heard. And now, 60, verse 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. There it is, the central theme of Mark. Who is Jesus? And here in, in John's account, we see that that. Peter is, is kind of a leadership role now. He's saying, we, he's speaking for the group. We know who you are. We believe that you are the, um, you have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is a monumental moment. It's the first open confession that the twelve have, uh, will make. John MacArthur says, what convinced the disciples of the truth? All the teaching and the miracles before the feeding of 5,000, was that it? Was it the feeding itself? Remember, the feeding was the biggest miracle yet and had an immediate hopeful effect on the crowd. But look at verse 52. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it. We're back in, John, uh, uh, in Mark 6. 52, and he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. So when were they converted? Have they been converted yet, according to Mark? Sometime, we can understand, sometime they were converted after hearing Jesus' sermon in the synagogue in Capernaum, after hearing the hard words the offensive words that caused so many to abandon Jesus. Jesus says in verse 63 of John 6, It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So, we can be sure that the Holy Spirit used the cumulative effects of their entire time with Jesus to bring them to faith. His calling, when they, he called his disciples, his teaching them, his performing exorcisms, miracles of healing, his protecting them, and calming their fears. Imagine all, all they've gone through all of this now for, all, for at least two years and beginning the third year. But they couldn't get the idea of, of revolt. We've got to do something to be free of this Roman occupation. And in Acts 1, the very first chapter of Acts, you don't have to turn there, verses 6 and 7, I'll read it. This is after the resurrection and right before the ascension. Acts makes me think when we did Acts, uh, um, can't, here it is. Um, the disciples asked him, this is after the resurrection, before the ascension, 
the disciples asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? See, they were still focused on that. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. So it's clear that most of Jesus' followers still expected him to lead an overthrow of Roman rule. Back to Mark 6. Walking on the water, he meant to pass them by. What does that mean? He was just going to come close and not stop? He meant to pass them by. The Phillips translation says, he meant to come alongside them. They all saw him. How are we to understand this passage? Had Jesus just to come in to their sight to give them hope? To test their faith? Was the water he stepped in calmed by his feet? Was a path of calm water laid out for Jesus? Did Jesus get wet? The disciples screamed in fear at seeing a ghost. Who would have seen him first? Those who were rowing, because they're rowing backward. They're looking at the shore, and all of a sudden, here he comes this way. Hey, guys. Check this out. What? Matthew 14, you don't have to turn turn there. In the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Fourth watch, what time is that? 3 a.m. at least. Fourth watch is from 3 to 6. It seems reasonable since Jesus knew their dilemma and wanted to rescue them. John MacArthur says, after all, The boat held the seeds of the kingdom, and those 12 men needed to be preserved, protected. Here was a little kingdom in a little boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, in a storm in the middle of the night. We know now that the Holy Spirit was using the experience to convert their souls. Peter walks on the water too, and Matthew's account is the only one That includes that Peter, now I'm going to, you can turn if you want to, but I'm going to read it. Matthew 14, verse 28 through 33, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat, Matthew's account, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And there it is again, the central focus of Mark's gospel. So what's with Peter? Testing his own faith, testing Jesus' divine power? He wants to be closer to Jesus than the other disciples? Remember, there was some I'm, I'm, I'm more favored than you are in his eyes. Maybe Peter feels safer being closer to Jesus than apart from him with the others in the boat. Maybe Peter feels safer being under the Lord's authority. He says, command me, order me. As soon as you do that, the responsibility goes to the one issuing the orders. I'm not responsible. Order me, and I'll obey it. And that gave him a sense of security, a sense of being where the Lord wanted him to be. Peter's faith is a lot like ours. Honest faith mixed sometimes with doubt. 
And we know this later in Mark. We'll get to it when we get to chapter 9. When Jesus has cast out a demon from a boy possessed by a demon from birth. You remember that story? And how long has he been doing this? Since birth, says the father. Um, and Jesus said to him, and he says, um, the, 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 um, the father says, cast out the demon if you can. And Jesus replies to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, there's that word again, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. You feel the tension? Jesus says his disciples don't have any, it's not that they don't have any faith. He says to Peter, you have little faith. That's why it's so important for us to grow in our faith. I remember being in Germany uh, in the Bible study, I think led by the chapel. We had a new commander come in and uh, he um, came in and, and I don't know where he was spiritually, I don't even remember his name. But he said to the chaplain, Grow my faith. That's what the commander wanted. Grow my faith. And that's what we all want, isn't it? And we're confident that he will. He will never let us leave. He's always got us in his hand. Isn't that a comforting thought? So why does Mark not mention Peter's walking on the water? Remember Peter's influence on Mark. Maybe Peter said, I don't want that in there. Why would he not want it in there? <laughs> well, maybe he was embarrassed by it. Maybe he thought it would put him, Peter, in too prominent a role, and he wanted the, role, the focus to be on Jesus and not on him. Sproul says, the whole incident of walking on the water could have been a great encouragement to the Gentile readers of Mark's gospel in Rome. Remember at the beginning of this class, we said, who is Mark uh, directing? To whom is Mark directing this gospel? It's to Gentile believers in Rome enduring some severe persecution. Sproul says, the whole incident of walking on the water could have been a great encouragement to the Gentile readers of Mark's gospel in Rome. They too, says Sproul, were making little headway against the winds of persecution in Rome. MacArthur also points out that Jesus demonstrates his love for Peter and for the disciples by reaching for Peter's hand. The disciples need to believe not only in Jesus' power, they need to be convinced of his love for them. Sinclair Ferguson says there are two lessons here for the disciples. They need to recognize their hearts were hard, and for that reason they failed to see Jesus as the caring shepherd that he was and as he fed, he fed the thousands. And that they, if he did that, if he loved them, then he would certainly take care of them in their distress at sea. But they failed to see the glory of their master when he created food to feed the thousands, and when he said, it is I, don't be afraid. I want to jump now to back to Mark. Mark 6, starting at 53, to the end of the chapter. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. Remember, they were familiar with this territory. Here's a land two and a half times the size of Harford County, some 200 towns and villages in it, fairly densely populated, 
People knew everybody. They knew all the roads. They knew the shortcuts, everything. They laid the sick. They, so people spread out and said, guess who's back? Jesus. He's on the shore at Gennesaret. And wherever he came, and they, and they brought him, and wherever he came, that is, uh, he began to his ministry again. Wherever he came in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Gennesaret is a beautiful spot, apparently, on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, south of Capernaum, north of Tiberias. There's a picture in 56 of the peripatetic, that is the wandering around, the walking around picture of Jesus in Galilee, a picture of common grace. Remember that all who were healed got sick again and died a physical death. It's, it's, this is amazing, but it's temporary. As Jesus moved through the district of Galilee, people followed him with their sick on pallets, or thin mattresses, really. If they were too late and missed him, they carried their sick from place to place until they caught up with him. <coughs> Healing was the name of the game, apparently, since Mark makes no mention of teaching in Gennesaret. Sinclair Ferguson points out that Jesus responded to, quote, endless needs. If you're married, said Ellie, you have issues. If we're li living in a fallen world, we have endless needs. They just keep coming. Ferguson points out he responded to endless needs, even to folks whose hearts were unconverted. This is another picture of common grace. Everyone benefits from common grace. The crowd sought him out for healing and for signs and wonders, but just being near him and receiving the good things from him doesn't mean that you believe in him and that you trust him as the divine Son of God, like Herod with John the Baptizer. It's possible for us to be hearers of God's Word and even intrigued by it, remember? Intrigued by what John the Baptizer had to say. And at the same time, to have hearts that are darkened and hardened against it. Sproul sees this section as the clear manifestation of the glory of God. He agrees that the crowd was likely getting forceful and eager to start the revolt and to drive the Romans out of the land. Clearly, Jesus was a man of prayer, says Sproul, but the Bible describes Jesus in solitary prayer in only three occasions. When he was about to call the disciples, remember that? He left that house and he came, he spent time, and then he began to call his disciples. That's the first time. The second time is right here. We've just read about it. He's climbing a hill, he's dispensed the crowd, he's ordered the disciples to get into the boat and get out of here. He's going to meet them in Gennesaret. And the third time, says Sproul, is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, did he really walk on the water? Well, liberal scholars, uh, according to Sproul, would say, oh, Jesus was just walking. They say that he was just walking on a sandbar or that he had an optical illusion in the mist. Verse 48 he meant to pass them by. And I like the way Sproul treats this. He meant to pass them by. Does that mean he didn't, he wasn't going to go to the boat itself? Sproul reminds us to interpret Scripture by Scripture. And he takes us to two well-known theophanies in God's glory passing, quote, passing by. Moses in the cleft of the rock in Genesis 33 and Elijah at the mouth of the cave in 1 Kings 19. Elijah, the wind, the earthquake, and the fire. The Lord was not in the, the wind, not in the earth. It gives me chills to, to describe that. Remember how, how vivid um, an image this is. And then he hears a low whisper from God who was present. 
Elijah wrapped his face at the sound of the voice. Elijah, though he felt abandoned by God, he said, remember he said he's sitting there and he said, they're killing everybody and I'm the only one left. The disciples may have felt the same thing, struggling for hours in the middle of a stormy sea, says Sproul. We're done for. In the same way, says Sproul, Jesus made himself a theophany for the disciples to give them hope and to encourage them in their distress. I like this phrase. Sproul calls it the glory of God bursting through the shroud of humanity of Jesus. The glory of God bursting through his humanity. Remember, he's fully God and fully man. His disciples see him as men. The people, the crowd, the mob see him as, as a man. The disciples didn't recognize the glory of God. They saw a ghost. That word in Greek can be also translated demon. They, they, they were terrified. Sproul says he reassured them by identifying himself. He said, ego imi. That's an intensive form of the verb. I always think of Bob Brown, where I know he's studied Greek. Uh, it's an intensive form of imi, which means I am. It's the same intensive expression that Jesus used in the, state, the I am statements in, John, God, in John's gospel. And it's the same Greek translation of Yahweh, God spoke at the burning bush. This is a theophany, says Sproul, to soften their hearts, to demonstrate once again that he was the divine Son of God, but their hearts were hardened even after the miraculous feeding of thousands of people, and even after they heard Jesus call himself Ego Emi, and even after he got into the boat and the wind died down. Sproul says their hearts were made out of stone. Sin had caused great calluses to grow in their hearts so that Christ himself could walk in front of them on the water, and they still would not believe. In Mark, says they were utterly astounded. But as we read in Matthew, they worshipped when he got in the boat. John says the conversion occurred after Jesus' bread of the life sermon in the Capernaum synagogue. On the other side of the Sea of Galilee, now in, at uh, uh, Gennesaret, those who touched his garment were healed. Surely the Lord was in that place, says Sproul. Now Hendrickson, he considers why Jesus dismisses the crowd. It was getting late. Many people were far from home. People wanted to stay close to Jesus. He wanted, he, no, 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 go away. People wanted to make him their king. We heard about that, that political force is beginning. And Jesus wanted some private time with his father. Note the contrast, says Hendrickson. Note the contrast between the picture of Jesus alone in prayer on the hill and the disciples struggling in the storm at sea. Humanly speaking, the disciples were in danger. But in truth... The disciples were in no danger because no doubt Jesus was praying for their safety and survival so they can complete their God-given mission. And we too can take comfort in this combined picture of Jesus overseeing us when we're in crisis. And it's the same for the church, says Hendrickson. Has there ever been a time when the church was not in crisis? What's going on around us? Lord, the Lord is there, praying, sustaining, seeing, directing what's going on. In verse 48, he came to them. He came to them. Remember verse 48. It's deliberate. He meant to pass by them. That seems to describe how he would come to them. He went to them. He intended to go to them. How is he going to do it? He's going to do it maybe indirectly. That's what he's suggesting. 
maybe indirectly, maybe gently, maybe in a reassuring way, maybe up close to the boat to give them a chance to invite him into the boat. Maybe he would pass them by if he got no invitation from the disciples. Important point, says Hendrickson, the divine intervention does not necessarily rule out human action. Don't turn there. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Here's an example. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now, obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I've always loved that idea that he gives us, he fills us with the motivation, he fills us with desire for righteousness. John 6, 21, don't turn there. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Luke 24, don't turn there either, 28 to 30. So they, this is the uh, road to Emmaus. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He, that is Jesus, acted as if he were going farther. There they were, right together. But they, the disciples, urged him strongly, saying, Oh, stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he, Jesus, went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Jesus displayed in this whole scene omniscience, he knew what was going on, power, he could control it, and love, he reached out and got Peter's hand. The boat was heading southwest from Bethsaida to Capernaum, we talked about that. The rowers were rowing backwards, they looked towards where they had come from, they looked like a man, that couldn't be a man. Because men can't walk on water. They were superstitious. Like us sometimes. Nervous. Especially when a black cat crosses our path on the Friday the 13th. When we refuse to walk underneath a construction ladder on our way back to a hotel room, which happens to be number 13. As a boy in New York City, I learned that, and I was at age 10 or 11, I learned that some hotels don't designate a 13th floor. They go from 12 to 14. And you can see it in the elevators. Like Herod Antipas, who thought Jesus was John the baptizer come back from the dead, superstition reigned. The disciples shrieked in fear, even Peter, like Herod the Great, when he heard that the king of the Jews had been born in Bethlehem, leading to the slaughter of the innocents. Hendrickson points out, the disciples' hardness of heart was not like that of the Pharisees and scribes. Their hearts were hard because of unbelief and hatred The disciples had a little faith, not unbelief, and not hatred. Hendrickson closes this this section. He says, this is the scene at Gennesaret is a beautiful picture of Christ at work. And he leads us to a poem, it's a hymn now, by E. H. Plumtree. It's three verses, and I want to read it. This was printed in the Hendrickson book. Verse 1. Thine arm, O Lord, in days of old was strong to heal and save. It triumphed o'er disease and death, o'er darkness and the grave. To thee they went, the blind, the deaf, the palsied and the lame, the leper with his tainted life, the sick with fevered frame. 
One of the things I love about this, it has meter, this is poetry, it has meter and a rhyme scheme. All the way it's packaged is a wonderful way, it just adds so much strength to the, to the essence, the content of the poem. Verse 2, and lo, thy touch brought life and health, gave speech and strength and sight, and youth renewed and frenzy calmed, owned thee, the Lord of light. And now, O Lord, be near to bless, almighty as of yore, in crowded street, by restless couch, as by Genesareth's shore. Verse 3, be thou our great deliverer still, thou Lord of life and death. Restore and quicken, soothe and bless with thine almighty breath. To hands that work and eyes that see, give wisdom's heavenly lore. That whole and sick and weak and strong may praise thee evermore. I checked the Trinity hymnal, that's not in our hymnal. But there is, on, on 604, there is a, a, a hymn by E.H. Uh, e. Plumtree, uh, hymn 604. Don't turn there, I'm just... Rejoice ye pure in heart. Remember that, that it's such a... Rejoice, give thanks, and sing. That, those words are by Edward Plumtree, written in 1865. Closing this class, then, we stand with the eleven, all of us here. We've been drawn, we're kept, that is, protected, and one day we will be raised to eternal life in glory. Sovereign grace extended to undeserving sinners by the gift of saving faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God. The central theme in this Gospel of Mark. I open, do you have comments or questions on what we've, that failing will pray, we'll pray. Yes, Martha. Yes, Martha is pointing out that it's a wonderful picture here of Jesus drawing close to his people and people reaching out to him, and that's a wonderful relationship, I think is what you're saying, Martha. It's both, it's the same power, it's the same, it's the same uh, Lord, so that in both cases. Yes, it's the same, it, it's the same power that's at work here. It's the same power, and it's what's underneath it is love. The love of Christ is underneath all of these wonderful, uh, these wonderful uh, acts. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for giving us this time freely to uh, get into your word, to ponder it, to let it draw uh, deeply, uh, draw us uh, deeply into this uh, relationship that you have established and to extend deep roots uh, in our souls even as we come by the power of your spirit to come to understand it better and be just floored by it, thrilled by it, encouraged by it, strengthened by it. Lord, your work in our lives had made all the difference. And what's really encouraging is that you are continuing to grow us in faith. We pray gratefully in Jesus' name. Amen.